And let us look to the Lord in a word of prayer again. Father, we are thankful for the joy in our hearts because your son Jesus is living and abiding and ruling there by faith. He is our source of joy and rejoicing. He's our sufficiency for all things. And Lord, especially during these difficult days that our country and nation and the whole world are facing, we're so thankful that we have the, the privilege to count on Christ. No matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through, He remains faithful. Always, all the time. So thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for your word and your Holy Spirit that minister your truth and grace and encouragement and comfort to us. Might you bless your word to our hearts this hour. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And so the question that we wanted to start with today is, where is God? Where is God in the midst of the difficulties that we're facing in this world? Some would say, God is in heaven. And that would be correct. We wouldn't argue with that. Others would say that God is in my heart and life through faith. And that would also be a correct answer as well. And some would say, well, God's right here with us as we're meeting. Because God's word says we're two or three are gathered in his name. He's there in the midst. And so these answers are correct, but they're not complete. Um, because they are limited in their scope. Um, they are looking at a specific place or point in time. Uh, yes, the, the heaven, God is there in heaven, the believer's heart, the assembly of saints, God is in each of those. But the Bible tells us that God is in a whole bunch of places all at the same time. All at the same time. Now, have you ever tried to be in two places at once? And parents can probably rate, yeah, I tried to get my child here to this practice and that run here. And it's really hard to be in two places at once. <laughs> it's really actually impossible for us. But it's not impossible for God. So please take your Bibles, if you have one with you today, one there in the pew, one at home. Uh, go ahead and open to Psalm chapter 139. In the book of Psalm and the 139 chapter. So Psalm 139 and verses 7 through 10. We just want to look at that as we get going today. Psalm 139, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And so David is the author of this psalm, and he says in verse 7, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. David is telling us that there is no way that we can escape the presence of God. We cannot find a place or a spot or a hideout where God is not there. He is everywhere. Wherever we go, God is already there. The, the bedroom, the boardroom, the, the bar room, wherever you go, God's there. God's already there in all of those places. He is everywhere present. We spend a lot of hours each day rushing here and there, but God never has to go anywhere. And why is that? He's already there. He does, there's nowhere that God has to move to or go to. He's already there. Uh, there is a very um, little that our mind can try and catch up on that. And so we need to be able to think about God is everywhere present. A Sunday school teacher, they're known for having some wisdom, aren't they? Sunday school teachers, we appreciate them. And one of them asked a young man, he said, uh, why is there but one God? And so that's a good discussion conversation around the table together. And this young man said, because God fills every place and there is no room for another God. And that was a pretty good answer. You have gods everywhere. You can't have two of them everywhere all at the same time. Turn over to Jeremiah, another verse that helps us to get a handle on God's omnipresence. Over in Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah 23 and verse 20, 23, and actually verse 23 and verse 24. Jeremiah, chapter 23, verse 23. It says, 
Am I a God? I, am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? And so these two verses, again, letting us know that God is at hand or near each and every one of us. That means that he is everywhere present. He is not removed off to some far distant place. Uh, we don't have to try and take a long trip to try and find God. He is there. He fills all of heaven and all of earth because he is everywhere. Now, there's no place in the universe where God is not present. Theologically, we're talking about the omnipresence of God. And we're looking at that God is not limited to a place and he's not limited by space. God is not confined in a box in the universe, and neither should we be restricted to try and put God in a box. Uh, yet we need to be careful in our thinking about God that we do not ascribe to him things that are not true. Because we have said that God is everywhere. We've said that. But we did not say that God is in everything. We did not say God is in everything. To say that is pantheism. Pantheism is to confuse creation with the creator and try and make them the same, and that is not accurate. God has made creation, yet he is separate and distinct from it. God is not in the flower in the field. He's not in the animals in the forest. He's not in the wood and the trees. He is everywhere present, but he is not in everything. We need to keep these truths continually before us, or else we'll end up believing everything that we see on TV instead of everything that's in God's word. And so God is everywhere, and he's created everything, and he's holding it all together through the power of his Son. Colossians 1.17 tells us, and he, Jesus Christ, is before all things, and by him all things consist. Jesus is holding all things together and making them consist. He is the constituting and conserving cause, the cause that is making things stay in reality. If Jesus would stop holding creation together, it would fly apart and cease to exist. And that is the omnipotence of God, and that's going to be the next time we get together. We're going to talk about that. Right now we're talking about the omniscience of God, so we're going to continue with that. Since God is everywhere and fills every place with his presence, we need to be aware of it and then tune ourselves into it. We don't have any trouble understanding our homes and our world that are filled with all kinds of radio waves and satellite signals and all those type things. And if you have proper devices uh, with your, your um, CB radio scanners, cell phones, laptops, tablets, and all those type things, if they are plugged in and, and connected properly, then they're able to function the way they were designed. And so likewise, we need to be tuned into connected properly with God for our lives to function properly. He is here, and just like those waves are here, we didn't see the waves, but they work when they connect with him, and God is here. He is very near each of us, and he works in our lives as we're properly connected to him as well. The problem is that we get so busy with the cares of this life that we neglect to take into account the presence of whom? God. We forget to acknowledge that God is here with us that he is everywhere present, and we need to be able to take that into account. When we ignore our Savior and refuse to live by faith uh, in him, then that just results into our uh, sorrow and shame and even sin. It's one thing to have correct doctrine. God is everywhere. We can believe that in our head. It's another thing to have correct behavior where we actually depend upon him each and every day, that he is actually with us. So question for you. What does an arm, a toaster, and a cell phone all have in common? To function, they need to be properly connected in order to be fully functional. And so if you disconnect your arm from its shoulder, it's going to be there. It's not going to be able to be fully functional. And so the same thing goes with our spiritual lives. We need to be properly connected to God to be, spiritual, uh, to be fully functional. We can say we believe all the right things about God, but if we don't show up, show that in our conduct in practical ways, then we're kind of both lifeless and fruitless. It's like we're that toaster or cell phone still in the box, full of potential, but really absolutely doing no good uh, for, for anyone. So all right then, now, what are some practical implications today for our personal lives concerning the fact that God is everywhere? How does that help us, or how should it help us in this world? So four ways that the presence of God benefits you and me 
personally and practically all the time. First is, when I'm lonely, God is my companion. When I'm lonely, God is my companion. And I can count on that concerning the truth that God is already here with me. He is present. Psalm 25, 1 says, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Verse 16, Turn thee unto me and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. David was lonely, and he turned to the Lord. He relied and trusted upon the presence of God to sustain him and comfort him. How many of us here today have learned the secret of drawing our strength from the Lord when we are lonely? David did, and so should we. It's an amazing thing that there are more people in the world today than ever before, and yet there are more lonely people in the world today than ever before. Now, some of you may be lonely because of the death of a spouse or a friend. Some may be here today lonely because of divorce. Some may be visiting today because of a business trip that brought them to the area, and they're many miles away from their family and from their friends. Starting a class or taking a course at a new school can produce a certain amount of uh, loneliness in our lives. There's loneliness uh, that occurs when we think that nobody understands us or nobody cares about us. It causes some loneliness. In one way or another, all of us will experience loneliness in this life. We can't go through it without it. None of us escape those lonely moments when we feel abandoned, unwanted, useless, unloved, or all alone. It's bewildering, isn't it, that you can actually be in a crowd and still feel alone. I can remember back to when I was in a restaurant full of people waiting on the, to meet someone there and just felt so alone. Everyone else had someone to talk to, someone to laugh with, someone to share a meal with, and there I sat alone. It's very strange in concerning being crowded. Or go off to college and you're in a dorm of 450 people and you don't know a soul. It's like, ah, all alone in all of that. Well, in the book of Genesis, what's the first thing that God looked at that he didn't like? It is not good for man that he should be what? Alone. God didn't want us. He didn't create us to be alone. We have to be living in relationships healthy relationships, God-honoring relationships. God doesn't want us to be lonely. And so we, when we do, when we find ourselves in such a situation, is that we need to get, look to the Lord in all of that. At such times, we need to recognize God's presence and connect and count on the fact that he is our companion. Now, Hebrews tells us, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's the promise that God has made that we will never walk alone. Even in the most difficult of times, probably one of the hardest times in the life of David is found in 1 Samuel chapter 30. If you want to go back to uh, 1 Samuel 30. I want to read some verses for you. I don't know if any of our lives will end up in such a difficult situation as this. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. Now when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziglag, and they had overcome Ziglag and burnt with fire and taken captive the women uh, and all who were in it, both small and great. And they killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. So David and his men were out on a mission. They were on an excursion. Uh, those, the family members were left behind in a place of safety. But while they were away, away Another invader came and burned the city, took everyone away, and now David's coming back with all of his men uh, in verse 3. And when David and his men came to the city, they found that it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. This is a very broken-hearted group of people lost everyone that they loved, everyone that they cared about, everyone that they had dreams and, and future and, and, and hopes for and with. And David's two, uh, two uh, wives were also taken in verse 5. They were taken captive, uh, Hinnaman, uh, Jezreel, and also Abigail, the widow of Nabal, of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, not only because he lost his two wives, for the people spoke of stoning him. You've heard the saying, 
hurt people hurt people, right? Here's a whole military outfit, um, men of war that are now hurting, sorrowful, upset, angry, frustrated, and mad. Someone needs to pay. Someone's to blame. Someone's going to get their head chopped off. Well, it continues on. Because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. And so what did David do? But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. I don't know if you're in the habit of marking your Bible, but that is probably a verse that you probably should either highlight or underline or put an asterisk by to strengthen himself in the Lord his God. To know how to turn toward God and to God in difficult times of life when we are needing to know that he is there to help us. And so what did David do? He encouraged himself because God knew exactly what was going on. And so because God was David's companion. He was able to lean on God to cheer him up. The idea of God as a companion is there to strengthen us and help us during those lonely times. Um, This is one of the benefits of God, knowing that he is everywhere. Because elsewhere, David writes, in thy presence is fullness of joy. Do we know how to enter God's presence? Linger in God's presence? draw joy from being with God in his presence, as David did. We need to be a people who draw that strength from him, recognizing that God's presence in the circumstances of life cheers us up, dispels the darkness, removes the gloom, takes away the loneliness. There's never a situation or circumstance where God is not there. All we have to do is to plug into his presence and connect with his person. And so when I am lonely, God is my companion, and he cheers me up. Secondly, when I'm worried, God is my confidence. Over in Isaiah 43, 2, When thou pass through the waters, I will be with thee, and though the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, it shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. None of us can predict the problems that we're going to be facing. Just as life brings us lonely times, life will also bring us troubling times. Trials, which tend to take and shake our faith to its very foundations, will come into our lives. But what we can be certain of is this fact, that God is going through it with us. We don't have to worry if we're going to have enough strength to make it. God does, right? We don't have to worry if we're going to have enough money to pay all the bills, because God does. He's taking care of all of our needs. Uh, We don't have to uh, give in despair because we don't know how things are going to turn out in the end. God does, and he goes with us all the way. And so when I'm worried, God is my confidence because he is right there with me. That's the message that God gave to Moses when he was worried about leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. Moses claimed claimed that he couldn't talk well enough. So what did God say to him? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. God's presence needed to be Moses' confidence. Any amen? God's presence needed to be Moses' confidence. It had to be Moses' confidence then. It needs to be our confidence today as we go through life. Joshua had to learn the same lesson as he was going to be leading the nation of Israel to the Jordan River. Joshua 1.9, Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Wherever Joshua went, no matter how high the mountain, how deep the valley, how strong the city that he was going to be fighting against, God was right there with him. God's presence needed to be Joshua's what? Confidence confidence that God was with him. Joshua was not alone, and he was not without help, and neither are we. You and I have God's help with us as well, and his presence needs to be our confidence. Psalm 16, 8 says, I have set the Lord always before me, or I'm always aware of the Lord's presence. David was. 
Are you? Am I? Aware of that. Because at his right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, the psalmist also tells us, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh shall also rest in hope. David is saying that God is his confidence. God is so near to David that nothing can shake him or scare him into worrying. Instead, he feels completely secure, safe, at rest, and at peace. His heart is glad because he knows that his life is hidden in the palm of God's hand, and nothing and no one can pluck him out of it. David is completely calm because he's trusting the presence of God. And so when I'm lonely, God's presence cheers me up. When I'm worried, God's presence calms me down. We can even face death with a calm assurance, because what do we read in Psalm 23? Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will, what? Fear no evil. I'm confident in God as he goes with me through difficult times. Third point for how this doctrinal and theological truth of the omnipresence of God impacts us in personal and practical ways. Third truth, when I am tempted, God is my counselor. 1 Corinthians 10.13 tells us that there is no temptation taken us but such is common to man. But God is faithful who will not permit us to be tempted above that we are able, but with the temptation also make the way of escape that we'll be able to bear it. God is with us when we face temptation and he is there to provide a way out. Whenever we face a temptation in our own strength, relying on our own wisdom and abilities, we're going to fail. But we need to realize God is there and God is the answer, and he will provide the solution. The question is, will we accept the direction that he wants for our lives? Will we make the changes that God wants us to make? Will we stop doing certain things and start doing the things that God wants us to do? 1 Corinthians 10.13 that we've been talking about tells us a few things about temptation, that they occur often, that they are, there's not a day goes by when we're not hammered on and hit hard. They're also common, and there's a temptation that we all face, and we are just we need to be aware of that. And then there's the, uh, the occur at the God's presence while he is looking on. So we need to keep, and the key is to staying properly connected with God while being unplugged from sin. Practicing the presence of God helps us out of every temptation that we face. God's presence, it cheers us up, it calms us down, it helps us out all along the way. Job said in 7, 13, 7, 27, God looks narrowly under my paths. In other words, God keeps a close watch on everything that we do and everywhere we go. He is right there with us and he sees it all. Nothing is hid from him. God is watching and he then needs to watch over our lives. How many students cheat on a test when a teacher is standing over the shoulder watching them? Not very many. It's when they think no one's watching, that they try and get away with something. Uh, we need to remember that God is watching us, and he's right near with us, and he's the one who is helping us. He helps us out. And when I'm discouraged, God is my comforter. That's the fourth point, and he will see me through. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saves such as a contrite spirit. God is right there when we're down and out, discouraged, depressed. God is there. God is close to the brokenhearted. He sees our condition. He knows our hurts. He understands how rough and difficult life has become. And so today, you may be ready to give in or to give up, but what God is waiting for is for you to give your life over to him. God wants you to put your faith and trust in him for him to heal you, to help you, to cure you, to change you, to save you, to set you free, for God to be at work for his good and perfect will. His blessings go to those who trust in him. He wants to be our comforter. He wants to be in your life and to be the strength of your encouragement. He loves us so much and has a perfect plan for our lives. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. God will only do good and not evil if we would only let him help. And so today we've been saying to be properly connected to God is to be fully functional for God. Just a little thought here for today. A glove, not good or bad, but certainly not alive and not doing too much until what happens? It's filled with life. And then it becomes functional. A glove properly connected to a hand becomes fully functional. 
a person properly connected to God becomes fully functional. And that is how we are able to apply these truths, these um, ability of practicing the presence of God. We have to start out with inviting Christ into our life, looking to him to lead us and to guide us, and be able to be filled with him to lead us in the path that he has for our lives. The second thing, once we know that we're saved and in, in Christ, is to get quiet before the Lord. Because so many of us rush around so often, and so very much, we need to be able to slow down. I have something for you. A little exercise. Hopefully you can still see me at home over here. And so I'm going to sit down. And I want to encourage you in getting quiet before the Lord. To just pause. And because God is omnipresent, Think to yourself, God, you are here in this place. You, God, are more real than anything that I can see, anything that I can smell, anything that I can taste, anything that I can hear, anything I can touch. Just because my five senses are not physically letting me see, hear, taste, smell, or touch you, I know based upon the truths of your word, you're here in this place at this moment with me right now. And I choose to be quiet before you in, Lord, in, in, in love, to just quiet my heart, not rushing, not trying to force, not trying to make, not trying to figure, to just be quiet and to love you. Because... As I'm sitting here, and as you're sitting in the pews, or you're sitting at home, you can feel the presence of either a stool or a pew or a chair holding you up. The fact is, because of God's presence and his love for you, he is holding you up in every area of your life so much more than whatever you're sitting on right now. Amen? God at work in our lives. He's the one that's protecting, providing, holding you up, supplying your needs, loving you. <laughs> God at work because he is everywhere present. And so once you are in Christ, daily you must continue to get quiet in the presence of Christ, reminding yourself that he is Lord. He is King. He is in first priority. He is the one that needs to be honored and glorified with our bodies, with every breath that we take. That we are here for him, and we're living for that audience of one. So we get quiet before him. We need to know that we're saved, that we're in Christ. We have to just quiet down in quietness and in confidence, Isaiah tells us, will be our strength. We have to get quiet, talk to the Lord, Make sure he's in first place, the top priority of our life. And then we're going to be getting up from there in confidence, knowing, okay, Lord, you are going with me through this day. doesn't matter who I'm, you know, who I'm working with and who's trying to fight with me at work. doesn't matter my neighbor and he's of a different political, uh, political persuasion and he just kind of hates my guts. It doesn't matter what we're going through. Lord, I'm going through this day with you. I'm going to trust you and help me to honor you and to live for you. And so that's what we're looking at. If we're going to be practicing the presence of Christ, knowing the fact, and then acting like it's true each day, putting both our belief and our behavior together in practical ways. We have to invite Christ into our life. And then we have to get quiet in the presence of Christ. And then we have to talk to Christ about everything. What we're feeling, what we're thinking, what we're going through, what we're experiencing. First uh, Thessalonians 5.17 says to pray without ceasing. Make Jesus the one that you talk to the most. Not your neighbors, not your co-worker. Not, talk to Jesus. Amen? you got to talk to Jesus about what's going on in your life. And then thirdly, develop the habit of praise. Praising the Lord. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Praise powerfully propels us into the presence of God. 
as we praise him and thank him for the many good things that he's doing in our lives, we're able to then have that sense, that, that knowledge, that personal experience that God is near. He's not far off. He hasn't neglected us. He hasn't turned his back on us. He's right here with us. And we practice his presence every day. And so let's close in a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless us as we go on our way. Father, we are thankful for the truth that you are everywhere present. And it does behoove us, it's to our best benefit, if we practice your presence. Not just declaring it theologically, but Lord, personally applying it to our lives. Getting quiet with you each and every day. Trusting you for all that we need along the way. Lord, just believing that you are real alive and at work in us. That you will do what you've said you will do in your word. For you are ever faithful and we thank you for that. Father, thank you for the privilege to know your son Jesus. And if there's one here, or even one at home, that has not yet stepped across that line of faith and, and asked Christ to be their personal Lord and Savior, you might even give them the grace and the faith right now to say, Lord Jesus, please, Come into my heart and my life and save my soul. I confess to you that I'm a sinner and I have no way of making that right with God. I believe that you died for me and paid the penalty for my sins. I believe that you're the only one that can take care of them. Right now, would you please forgive me, save my soul and make me to be the person of God that you want me to be. Lord, thank you for the privilege of knowing you, knowing God, and living for your honor and glory each day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you and give you a very fruitful week in serving the Lord.